Good Lord, ride all the way. A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello, and welcome to a very special show here at SLU, presented alongside our partners at the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now tonight, a nearly full moon is at its furthest point from Earth in its orbit, appearing smaller in the sky than at any other point in the year. Now, throughout the show, we'll have these high resolution live images of the moon from SLU's flagship observatory, both here in the Canary Islands at the Institute of Astrophysics, which is where I'm reporting from, and also from our Southern Hemisphere Observatory in Chile. Now, to discuss all of this and to explain why tonight's moon is known as the mini pink moon, we have some great guests lined up. Uh, we've got uh, Stu Astronomer, and he's also the astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. He's going to be telling us about the moon's orbit and how it can, why, how and why it can appear larger and smaller throughout the year. Uh, then we are going to be joined by Janice Stillman. Now she's editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, uh, who, uh, who she, she's going to uh, offer some insight into why this particular full moon is known as the pink moon. And if you're interested in observing the moon from your own backyard or garden, we've got Brian Cogdell from Celestron on hand to recommend the kind of equipment you can use for moon gazing if you're new to astronomy. Now, if you have uh, any questions for me uh, or our esteemed guests tonight, just send them to at SLU uh, on Twitter, or use the SLU chat box if you're watching the show uh, on our live channel at SLU.com. Now, uh, let's kick off uh, our show by getting a better understanding of our closest neighbour, the Moon. And for that, there is no one better uh, than SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the show. And, uh, I'm really enjoying this uh, great live image that I'm seeing here from the uh, SLU observatories. Exactly. And we weren't sure whether we were going to get these live images to, to tonight because the humidity has been high. We've had clouds here all day. So some of the live images that we might see uh, might get a little bit foggy, but uh, they're still going to be pretty superb like this one actually this is from the uh, wide field telescope now we're going to see some of the other telescope images bob and you know strangely uh, the field of view of say the half meter telescope here at the canary islands observatory the moon usually doesn't fit within a single image the the, the corners of it get cropped off but tonight when we see those images uh they're not we're going to see the whole of the moon now nothing's changed with the telescope so What's causing that and why is this called a mini moon, Bob? Well, the moon's at apogee uh, right now, tonight. That's its farthest point because the moon's orbit, like every other orbit in the universe, uh, unlike what we believed a few centuries ago, is an ellipse. So it's not a circle at all. And every elliptical orbit gets closer and farther. I think everyone realizes that Earth gets closer to the sun at some times of the year, farther away at other times. Moon does the same thing, except the moon varies quite a bit. Uh, from surface to surface, it can come as close as 216,000 miles or as far away as 248,000 miles. That's quite a difference. So this is the, the perigee position that we're showing you here. And the apogee so, so you position said, when it's uh, farthest away, that's what we've got tonight. So these two terms, Bob, apogee is is what's commonly referred to when it comes to the moon, is, is when we talk about a mini moon and it coincides with a full moon or a new moon, in fact. Uh, and then you use this other term as well, perigee, when it's when it's closest towards the Earth. And we see another type of moon. We give that another name as well, don't we, here at SLU? A supermoon is what we've a been calling moon. it for uh, the last few years. Uh, 
and that's become a, a sort of popular thing. Actually, the perigees vary quite a bit. A perigee, a closest approach to us from month to month, can be 13,000 miles closer than other perigee moons. The apogee moons don't really vary that much. They can only uh, change by about 1,500 miles. So when you said this is the farthest away moon, and it is of this whole half year period, um, we uh, next month and the month after, the difference in how far away the moon can be, in other words, how many, how many can the mini moon get, really only varies by uh, 1,500 miles. So when you go out and try to observe it yourself and look for a little tiny moon, you will never be able to see the difference between a far a moon and a very far moon because there's just not that well, much difference. But the close-up moons, ah, that's another story. Exactly. And as we can see here, this is that uh, that image that I was telling you about. So this is a live image from SLU's half-meter telescope here at the Canary Islands Observatory. And usually in these, when we try and view the full moon uh, using that telescope, the sides get cropped off, but not tonight because its apparent size has diminish somewhat so it fits wholly within the image which is uh, providing a really cool that's image. right the Actually, difference is about seven cool. percent smaller than the average uh full moon and 14 percent smaller than a really close close-up moon such as the full moon will have this november this shows it very beautifully now this looks so very dramatic between uh, the full ah oh, here yes. we go bob uh i think you may have lost me a little bit uh, but yeah, here, yeah, here this is, is. I put this, this shows I put the this together nicely between a, uh, yeah, a very close up moon, with... a super moon, and a mini moon uh, in the sky. This actually looks bigger than the eye would see it because if you push this far enough away so that it looked the same size as it does to the eye, and you actually observed it, believe it or not, that would be just on the edge of what you would notice. It doesn't look that way. Right now on our computer monitors, it looks like there's a huge difference. There's a, there it is, this shows it very nicely. There's a 14% in size difference between the smallest or farthest away possible moon and the closest moon. And there we have them together. Believe it or not, once again, if you actually saw them side by side, if you could, in the night sky. You can't, of course, we only have one it, moon. It you can't ever yeah. see two moons, the farthest away moon, next to the closest possible moon. But if you could, it would right on the edge. It would be right on the edge of what the human eye is capable of noticing. Still, nonetheless, it is noticeable. And the moon is, I mean, we only have one of them, and it's the perfect circle <laughs> of the night. There are no other perfect circles regarded as sacred uh, throughout history, especially to the ancient Greeks, even through telescopes, we can't find any perfect circles. The other planets are always uh, off. They're squashed. They're elliptical. So there's, uh, I mean, the moon is special. No question about it. Bob, just just tell me uh, what, one other thing, actually, in this little segment. Do, does, it, does it have an effect on things like the tides or humans or animals or plant life when the moon, a full moon, is further away or closer to Earth? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, there are parts of the world, such as the Bay of Fundy uh, near Nova Scotia in uh, Canada, that the high and the low tides are only dependent on the uh, closeness of the moon. In other words, the apogee, the perigee, whether it's a mini moon or a super moon, yeah. that's what produces the, uh, the change in the tides. And there's a much, much less of an effect for the full moon versus the half moon, whereas in most of the rest of the world, it's the other way around. So yeah, depending upon where you live, it can be the major thing that affects the tides. And once you're affecting the tides, you're affecting the sea life, especially uh, those that live in the uh, intertidal areas, you know, that get flooded yeah. a lot, the crabs and their predators like gulls. There's there's a lot of the animal life on Earth that's attuned to the changing distances of the moon, as well as the changing so how, phases of the moon. So how about humans? You know, we, we, we hear an awful lot of folklore, including werewolves. In fact, we had the, uh, the full wolf moon, didn't we, I believe, to, to <laughs> kick off this year in January. You know, does it have any impact? Are there such things as lunatics or, or lunatics, which th their behavior is actually caused by, by the moon, Bob? 
Well, obviously, it's been believed that way for a long time because Luna is the Latin word for moon. And as you say, we have lunacy and lunatic, or these days we just say loony, a person is loony. Still, that all derived from the moon. Actual studies, though, show that um, there doesn't seem to be much to that in that accident rates, admissions to psychiatric hospitals, calls to crisis centers, homicides, and all of the measures of aberrant human behavior do not change or cycle up and down with the full moon or phases of the moon or when the moon is close. So, which you'd think it would just from the psychogenic effect. In other words, if enough people believe that the moon would influence them, you know it would. You know there'd be enough people who would be yeah. susceptible to this suggestion to actually behave differently uh, even if they didn't intend to. So it must mean that people are not very aware of things in the sky and the moon and so they don't respond to it psychologically because because as I say uh, even if, if it didn't on its own it would if people believed in it enough because the mind is very powerful. Uh, Bob we, we've got another beautiful live image coming in uh, from the half meter telescope. We have been so lucky tonight because we've had some horrible clouds which has stopped us all working here uh, today. Uh, but we've got all of SLU's telescopes operating tonight. So we've got the half meter telescope. We've also got the 17 inch telescope. We've got the wide field telescope. And we've also got some uh, closer up views that we'll probably see a little bit later uh, from the Chile uh, Observatory. Now, does the moon look different uh, from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere? Do, do people say oh, it differently? Sure, absolutely, because our friends down under are standing upside down relative to us. So <laughs> they're seeing the moon the same way we would if we were doing a yoga posture and standing, uh, doing a headstand and looking at the moon. That's how they're seeing it uh, at the moment. And we'll observe that if you switch to Chile at some point, you'll see that these uh, maria, those lunar dark blotches of solidified lava that Galileo and all of his buddies regarded as seas, that's what the word means, mare means seas, they thought that those were oceans, but we now know they're just smooth lava areas from an era long ago when there were volcanoes on the moon. Uh, we don't have them anymore. Uh, what I love about these images, Paul, and um, good for you that you're that that you're getting them in despite the marginal conditions at one of the observatories. Anyway, Slew's I, I just always in awe of Slew's equipment, and uh, notice how close to full it looks. We're we're a day from full, yeah. a little less than twenty four hours from full, and we're seeing not just the farthest away, the apogee moon, the mini moon. But we're also seeing very close to a full moon, and of course that stands high in lore and legend and mythology as well, partially because it's a circle, and a circle is the sacred shape for civilizations yeah. oh. through the ages. And as if on cue, Bob, there you go. There is uh, uh, an image from the High Magnification Telescope in Chile. Now, it, it it's not shown the other way, but that's because we artificially rotate all of SLU's images so that north is always up. But I have to say, um, whenever I go to the uh, the observatory in Chile, it takes me a while to kind of orientate myself with the constellations all looking slightly different. So you, you've mentioned some features there um, of the moon. Now you're going to join me a little bit later where you're going to uh, give viewers a little bit of guidance on the best times of the a cycle to actually observe the moon because you know as we'll cover there full moon actually isn't the best time to to observe the moon so bob we will see you a little bit later for that segment okay so see you soon now coming up uh we have got we're going to be welcoming janice stillman from the old farmer's almanac uh, to slew for the first time and uh, we're going to discuss why some cultures refer to this particular full moon as the pink moon we've already had the wolf moon we've had the worm moon this year already um, and this one is the pink moon and uh, janice is going to explain exactly why that is but before we get to that to the thousands of people tuning into the show 
from all around the globe. If you're enjoying what you're seeing and hearing tonight, you know, we do this virtually every night at SLU. And uh, I want to really encourage you to become a member of the SLU community. It's free to try and there's absolutely no obligation. Uh, you, you know, at, at its core, SLU members could control uh, any of the telescopes uh, at the robotic uh, observatories in the Canary Islands and in Chile. Uh, and it's really easy to do via a simple and powerful interface uh, to, to see everything really that kind of glows in space. In fact, uh, I haven't got the, the exact figures with me, but SLU members have taken well over 4 million photos of over 50,000 different objects in the sky. So at its core, you can control those telescopes, but Really, one of the most unique features about SLU is that we pioneered something that we call uh, social astronomy. And, you know, SLU works just like a jukebox. Uh, one member is in control of the telescope, while all members get to see what the telescope is viewing live, just as we're doing tonight. And while you're viewing it live, everybody can contribute uh, to the Uh, and online in the members clubhouse. Now, one big benefit of this is that regardless of your skill level, you can participate and learn from the community at your own pace. And, you know, best of all, although we, uh, we may be alone in the universe, but who knows, you know, I can promise you one thing, you will never be alone at SLU. Like cavemen and women gathered around the campfire, we gaze out and wander together about the universe and share our great diversity of perspectives, whether or not it's UFOs and aliens or a bit of science here or there, it doesn't matter what. It's a huge diversity of perspectives at SLU. It really is space for everyone here. So please give it a try. And in the process, you'll be supporting our ability to make programs like this available to the public. So I hope to see you in the SLU Clubhouse soon. Now, without further ado, I, uh, I want to welcome editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Janice Stillman, to our show tonight. Janice, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to SLU for the first time. Hi, Paul. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Well, we're seeing these live images coming in uh, from the SLU observatories tonight. And what, one of the reasons we love this partnership with you folks at the Old Farmer's Almanac it is your ability to add this very different perspective and context to the topics that we present. And one that really stems from history and folklore. So each of these full moons throughout the year have their own unique names. Now, this one, the full moon for April, among other things, is called the full pink moon. But how did it get that name? Why is it called the pink moon? Well, step back a few hundred years before this country was really settled and Native Americans lived here. And they, of course, lived all across the country and there were numerous tribes. And so they were experiencing all kinds of weather and climate conditions back then. And they actually assigned the moon's names. They didn't have radio or internet or paved roads or newspapers <laughs> or date books or anything to kind of keep them on schedule. So they, or the they old were farmer's really almanac. aware of nature. <laughs> they watched what happened around them. They looked for changes and signs. And one of those was the timing of what happened in nature outside around the time of the full moon. And they became aware that the moss pink, it's a wild ground phlox, would appear, would hearken the spring. And it would appear around the time of the fourth full moon, just after the winter, you know. So yep. the Algonquins in particular called the moon the pink moon. Now, that's not the only name or nickname, if you will, for the moon, because all across the country, Indians were naming the moon different things. So, for example, you also have the boiling down the sap moon. So that was probably uh -huh. where they were tapping maple trees or birch trees. And that, that's the, still for the April full moon. It, well, again, depending on where it was. I don't know exactly at this point, but that's yeah. one of the, the traditional names. Sprouting grass moon, fish moon, deep water moon, perhaps either a runoff or even a, an ice out on a lake, for example. 
So there are numerous names for the, the moons every month. Every month, indeed, there are several. We typically attach to you know, the most popular or most familiar one, in this case, pink. By the way, you probably addressed this, but it's not a pink moon, even. No, actually, we really haven't addressed it. No, no, the, it, it has no bearing on its actual color. We, maybe that's a real basic we should have started the show off with, Janice. <laughs> Well, we can see here, the pictures are phenomenal. That is, is really tremendous reception. Yeah, well, this is coming in from the Chile Observatory. And, uh, you know, we get these high resolution live images. And, you know, it's, it's fabulous tonight that we've got both observatories and all of the SLU telescopes all pointed to this, you know, nearly full pink moon. So, so really, the, the Native American tribes were, were really using these full moons as a calendar and naming them because naming is a great way of remembering and storytelling, presumably. Exactly. And again, you got to put yourself in that mindset back when the, the, everything was rural, you know, there were no cities and towns and, you know, it was a, it was a communication tool. It was a storytelling tool. It was a way of just, again, recognizing the, the natural cycles and, and plan and expect plan to expect actually what's going to happen next. You, you mentioned the, the wolf moon was an indication of when it was deep cold and the wolves were howling. We have the full mm. snow moon because everything was snowed over certain parts of the country. So every month there are several names that again indicate what was going on in nature at that time and enabled them to share and relate and predict and again, have a plan for the coming season. Yeah. And, and a very easy way of passing that information down through the generations. Now, what, why does the, the Old Farmer's Almanac make a point of collecting and recording these uh, historical interpretations our ancestors made of, of their environment, like the folklore, you know, surrounding the moon? Well, the Old Farmer's Almanac is first and foremost a calendar of the heavens. And the rise and set of the sun, the rise and set of the moon, and all the moon's phases and various other events in the sky are a core part of the almanac. And the moon and its phases traditionally, rather like the Native Americans and everybody since then over several hundreds of years, has always been an indicator of when to do a lot of things, say gardening, planting above ground or below ground, yeah. fishing during the um, period from the new moon to the full moon is often the best. And then there are other small periods, if you will, in between the various phases. Mm. Best days to do a number of things. There's a lot of lore about the moon and the Old Farmer's Almanac perpetuates a lot of traditional values. So mm. our astronomical data, all of the events that are uh, announced and predicted for the, for the whole year in the sky are factual and reliable. In fact, Bob Berman, who was on earlier, is one of our astronomers and provides a lot of that information. But then you've got the tradition, the folklore, because the Old Farmer's Almanac is about yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And in the same way that the Native Americans would practice, it's also about the traditions and observing nature. So it's right. all about noticing what's around you. In the world we live in today, so often that gets overlooked. No it pun does. Intended. It does. So, so, so really, it's 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 a celestial to-do list, but it, it's it also kind of helps and guides us to point us to maybe open our eyes up to to what's surrounding us and what's changing, you know, from season to season, month to month, and season to season. Uh, so exactly. now this time of year also celebrates uh, other holidays of sorts, doesn't it? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what's coming up for environmentalists and, and nature enthusiasts? I think there's Earth Day, is there? What's that about? Exactly right. I mean, Earth Day is anybody who's into the environment and, you know, cleaning the earth is certainly aware that April 22nd, historically, for well, since the 1970, is Earth Day. And mm. this was founded by two men really about the same time back in 1970, after a period of, oh, oil spills and traffic jams mm. and pesticides and, you know, a lot of difficulties around the U.S. and many parts of the world, actually, in yeah. terms of um, environment. And it was Gaylord Nelson in Wisconsin 
and John McDonald, an activist in San Francisco, who both hit on the idea of having an Earth Day that would enable people to learn about the environment and celebrate the environment, clean up the country, clean up their, their area. And uh, one gentleman had the day on the equinox that year, and uh, Gaylord Nelson settled on April 22nd. And then they merged, and it's been April 22nd ever since. Ever since. And there are still, still programs around the world and the one thing that folks can do that is typically a, um, an Earth Day activity is to plant a tree. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, oh. well, perhaps I'm up here on the on the mountain, actually, on the top of a volcano in the Canary Islands, and I, I know that there's a, there are large groups here um, who look after the native vegetation. And I happen to know that there's a small enclosure uh, with some of those plants out in their pots. Uh, so I think that's what I'll do tomorrow, Janice. I will celebrate Earth Day by planting one of the indigenous uh, species up here on the mountain. And uh, we have to ring fence it, of course, as well, because rabbits, which are not indigenous to the Canary Islands, unfortunately uh, wreak havoc with uh, most of the most of the plant life up here so so uh, people can find out more information about the old farmers almanac where well certainly at our website almanac.com you can oh, all kinds of easy. information i invite them to yep. become a friend on facebook facebook slash the old farmers almanac and of course the book behind me here the cover is an oversized version you don't have to carry that around in your pocket it's actually <laughs> quite convenient <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the Old Farmer's Almanac is available wherever books and magazines are sold, and also it's available digitally for just about anywhere, anybody anywhere around the world. So um, it's very uh, much and, uh, and of it, the moment. Yeah. It, it is fascinating. I, I think for anybody who's interested in the earth or just life, nature, just just everything around us that's natural, basically, it, it's fascinating. So uh, Janice, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you and uh, your other experts from the Old Farmers Almanac for future SLU shows. So thank you for joining thank us tonight. Thank you very tonight. much, Paul. It's been delightful. Good night. Now, that was Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmers Almanac. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, uh, Bob Berman, will return to help us determine the best time of the month for you to do your own moon watching from your own backyard, or of course, using SLU's robotic telescopes. And those are the telescopes which are giving us these gorgeous, gorgeous live views. We are so lucky to have these views. I, I mean, it was just totally cloudy and rainy here all day long. Uh, Chile was not looking great either. And then literally moments before uh, the show started, the heavens cleared. So anyway, after Bob, we are also going to hear from Brian Cogdell from Celestron, and he's going to tell us exactly what kind of equipment you might need to observe the moon from your own backyard. So don't miss that. But before all of that, I want to remind you of a couple of really big shows we've got. Well, the second one's really big. The first one is kind of really exciting. Uh, we've got coming up uh, tomorrow night. We will be heading out for an evening of stargazing for the Lyrid Meteor Shower. That starts at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. Uh, we'll have the full moon to contend with, as we've been talking about. Uh, but we should still see uh, you know, some of the brightest Lyrid meteors. And we have a load of experts to tell you all about meteor showers throughout that whole period. So that's going to be fascinating listening to that in any case. But then on May 9th, We've got the big one, and actually it's one of the reasons I'm here, because I'm installing a new solar telescope, special solar telescope for SLU members to use. And this event on May 19th is ideal for it. We will be watching live views from Dubai, Europe, Africa, the Canary Islands, and the USA as the tiny planet Mercury makes its way across the face of the sun. Uh, I think I said May 9th. Uh, that was that was correct. Anyway, it's going to make make that Mercury is going to pass in front of the sun. It's the transit of Mercury show. And it's one that you really do not want to miss. Coverage starts 7am Eastern and runs for over seven hours as we bring you that awesome and rare live event. Now, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this short 
commercial break. We'll see you in a second. Well, that was a timely commercial, wasn't it? Considering our guest later on uh, coming from Celestron, he's uh, the astronomy product manager at Celestron. But welcome back. You are watching the mini pink moon live at SLU. Let's welcome back SLU astronomer. And he's also the astronomy editor for the Old Farmers Almanac, everybody's favorite, Bob Berman. Hi, Bob. Hi, great to be back. <laughs> Now, did you hear uh, the interview with uh, with Janice? I heard it and saw it, and it was a lot of fun for me. She's looking beautiful. Um, <laughs> I last saw her in a bathing suit. Maybe it wasn't the final time, but it was one of the last times in the middle of Alaska in winter. Yes, in a swimsuit. Okay. So I how don't does think that we should delve. Because <laughs> we were both part of the same tour. Uh, that uh, the Old Farms Almanac is actually uh, part of presenting, that I do every year, to see the Northern Lights from central Alaska. Uh -huh. And the best time of year is February or March, still winter time then. So uh, we were there in, at a hot spring with the Northern Lights uh, overhead at night. So I, I can say that uh, uh, she looked very respectable there in front of the microphone, just then, but we were the last time we had little ice crystals forming on us because it was uh, quite a bit below zero, even though we were comfortably in a hot spring. Anyway, yes, well, I it's hope great your, to hear I that. Hope your, and, I hope your editor in chief at the Old Farmers Almanac is 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 okay that you shared that story, Bob. So thank you very much I for hope, that. I hope so too. <laughs> but as she said very eloquently, the uh, the Old Farmers Almanac uh has now for at least 25 years 30 years at least since i've been associated with it um really focusing and and we really goes back centuries before that on um astronomical events during the year i mean this is just one part of the almanac but it's a big part and uh, but this accurately is the part that you author. showing this is the part that you when, author isn't it bob Yes, yes. Showing yes. when the moon has different phases and what the planets are doing night by night and and uh, and everything else. And uh, ever since the time of Benjamin Franklin, it's been a go-to resource, not just for people interested in the folklore and um, mm. the gardening and all the other invaluable information that's really only found there and nowhere else, but also for the astronomy, frankly. So yeah. I think it's a great yeah. matchup. Uh, to do these shows, a combination of SLU with our live views of the universe and the Old Farmer's Almanac with the uh, famous for uh, presenting astronomy. It's just really, that that's a natural marriage, really. Well, we are looking forward to doing a lot more shows. And uh, we, we know that, uh, as well as yourself and Janice, of course, there are a whole slew, forgive the pun, of uh, experts over at the Old Farmer's Almanac. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing that really diverse range of views and opinions and facts and knowledge about celestial objects. Now, Bob, we are going to be talking to Brian Cogdell from Celestron a little bit later about the range of equipment our viewers could use to observe the moon. But the first thing people should really know about viewing the moon is, is when they should do it. And we, we said this earlier, didn't we? The full moon isn't necessarily the best time to observe the moon. Why not? No, and you can see it for yourself right now. This is the time when, of course, all the mythology and lore and legend surrounds it. But look at what we're seeing. And this is using the fine slew telescopes. We're seeing dark and light areas. We're seeing blotchiness. Down near the bottom, we see a round. You can't even tell it's a crater. It looks like a very odd round feature. It's really a crater. It's a crater Tycho with rays, white rays streaming away in all directions from it. However, 
Look at the moon when it's closer to a half moon, and then it suddenly is a crater ringed by mountains with a central mountain in the middle of it. And in fact, the moon, um, here I'll show you another one, just above center, halfway between the exact center and the top, there's a kind of diagonal slash. Now that's the most prominent mountain range on the moon. Ah, here we're seeing it through the Chile telescope beautifully. Again, go to the very center of the moon and go just directly up and maybe ever so slightly left from it. You'll see a diagonal slash, and here you can really tell that it is a mountain range. These are the lunar Apennines. Yeah. Well, um, at half moon, first quarter moon, that is, and the day after that, these are so striking. And notice how they point down and to the left to another white crater that has white rays streaming away from it. And this is the famous Copernicus, 55 miles in diameter with a double large mountain in the center and a smaller mountain also in the center. Walls around the edge that are 11,000 feet high that also cast their irregular shadows on the crater floor, a smooth floor of the crater. And all of these details can be seen, of course, through the SLU telescopes, but can also be seen uh, by backyard amateurs, but not now, yeah. not when the moon is full. Yeah. You can hardly tell that's a crater. It looks like a white, yeah. uh, a white spot, really, on the moon. So, yes, to answer your question in perhaps an unnecessarily long-winded way, I'd say any phase but the moon. Now, you don't really want a, a thin crescent because a thin crescent moon is always low in the sky, and when the moon is low, you get a lot of atmospheric turbulence and distortion. So the best moon the combination that it'll be high up in the sky and also the lighting will be perfect for mountain ranges and craters will be around the half moon and the next three days after the half moon. Or if you're talking about the last quarter moon, then you do it the other way around and you'd say for the three days before the third quarter or last quarter moon. And those are the optimum times to see detail on the moon. So very much... It does really vary during that lunar month. Uh, the moon takes 29 and a half days to completely go through its cycle of phases called the synodic month. And then it varies during the year as well. For example, if you're really going to look at the half moon, that half moon is best seen. Uh, it's highest up in the sky. Um, well, now and the next several months, pretty um, perfect yeah. for it. I mean, it, it, I, I'm often surprised, actually, when I s speak to people, how few people have ever turned, you know, even a pair of binoculars up to the moon. And, and when they do, you know, at those phases that you're talking about and they start seeing the shadows, it suddenly becomes this stunning three-dimensional object. Um, and, yes, and you just can't and that's what we don't have it. tonight on a night very close to the full moon. Notice, and this has been noted by the Greeks, by the way, since the 7th century BC. Notice that the moon looks flat, like a disc, like a dish. Look along mm -hmm. the edges, and you don't see a darkening called limb darkening that we see, for example, when our SLU telescopes are trained on Jupiter. We see that effect very strikingly. Here, the moon honestly doesn't look like a ball. It doesn't look no. three-dimensional. It looks like it's almost no. painted onto the sky. And this flatness is a very odd feature of the moon that changes during other phases of the moon. You look at the moon when it's gibbous or crescent, and then it does look like a ball. So here you yeah. also lose the dimensionality. That flatness is very weird. It's due to the strange soil or regolith on the moon's surface, which has a habit of shining sunlight straight back toward the sun. Now, okay. where we are located tonight and tomorrow night and the night after, we're on line with the sun. Earth, sun, and the moon are forming a straight line in space. So the sunlight that's hitting the moon is bouncing it not only back to the sun, but back to our eyes as well. And that's what's giving the moon its um, odd it's flatness that we're, flat, that we're seeing. Yeah. Well, Bob, listen, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we are going to see you, I believe, tomorrow for our live Lyrid Meteor Shower broadcast. Uh, that's that's going to be uh, quite a long stint. Uh, you've got the full moon to contend with, but we're still pretty hopeful. And, you know, other than the, the live images as well that we're going to have, you know, there's loads of expert commentary, and I know you're going to make that a really fascinating event tomorrow night, Bob. Thank you. Yes, yeah, starting at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern.
Okay, well, we will see you then, Bob. Thank you very much for this evening. Uh, now, right Thanks, now, I want to welcome Brian Cogdill, Astronomy Product Manager at Celestron, the company that makes the telescopes we've used here at SLU uh, for over 12 years at our high altitude observatory here in the Canary Islands. Brian, thank you uh, very much for joining us here at SLU. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Uh, now, you're a little bit uh, soft in my earphones, so if you could speak up, but uh, now, Certainly, now listen. Yeah. Oh, that's How great. Does that's sound? perfect. Is that good? Yeah, oh, that's that's perfect. Now, as you may know, I'm currently at SLU's flagship observatory in the Canary Islands, installing two new Celestron telescopes uh, that we're really excited about. And when I say we, I mean us SLU members. Uh, we've got Celestron's new uh, specialist deep sky RASA telescope, uh, which is also going to be using uh, Celestron astronomical CCD. There it is, in fact. And we're this is the one that we are really, really excited about. I'm installing a new solar system telescope that that's going to provide SLU members with live video views of the planets and the moon every night. Now, that's pretty high-end equipment. And we know Celestron has this huge variety of great equipment for amateur astronomers and also nature enthusiasts as well, from basic binoculars through to observatory class telescopes and specialist astronomy cameras. But the average backyard astronomer might not need something as large as the Celestron telescopes we've been using over the years. So what are some of the telescopes that you would recommend uh, for a beginner in astronomy? Oh, certainly, yeah. This is where there's some good news here. When it comes to the moon, we are talking a very bright, very high contrast object. So um, the good news there is just about any telescope is going to do a phenomenally good job at seeing a lot of detail, especially as, as we were previously talking about how it's good often to see the moon when it's not full. You will literally be able to see details within the craters, uh, shadows cast by mountain ranges, uh, with, with really extraordinary detail. Now, for uh, backyard viewing of the moon, that's also a, a, a reality with just even a simple telescope. It's 100% accessible from the city, really from anywhere where you have a view to the sky. So we can start with something uh, really as straightforward as, as our uh, Power Seeker 50 millimeter uh, refractor. And the Power Seeker, is a, it's a small refractor, but again, we're talking about a high contrast, bright object. The moon does benefit from magnification. So you will, if, yeah. you know, obviously using a telescope, you're going to gather more light. You're also going to magnify the image. Um, you will be able to reveal a lot more detail than you would just with the unaided eye, just using the power seeker. And what's nice about it is, I mean, the accessibility of it is a telescope that, you know, it's this, this one is obviously um, uh, very affordable and it's something that yeah. you can literally just take outside in your backyard. It doesn't matter if you're in an urban sky or if you're in a rural sky, uh, the moon is not really, uh, is not affected by, uh, is not dependent on having dark sky, which is another good yeah. thing. That's what makes it so accessible. So a telescope like this uh, will, will do a great job. Um, it will start you off with uh, a series of eyepieces too. Now, when we change the oh, okay. eyepiece on the telescope, you can see in the photo here, just the, the end, obviously, that you're viewing through, through the telescope, uh, changing the eyepiece will change the magnifying power. And so basically with this telescope, we've assorted, we've assorted the setup with uh, basically like a, uh, a high, medium, and low set of magnifications with three different eyepieces. Um, so really, I mean, you can actually view the moon at any of those three magnifications, and it takes on a characteristic of its own. For example, the low power eyepiece, you can see the full disk of the moon, but with still, like I was saying, a lot more detail uh, than you would just with the unaided eye. You're seeing the full full disc from edge to edge, and it looks it looks great. Then you can go to the medium or the high power eyepieces, which will uh, magnify the moon. It'll appear closer, but you'll really be able to at that point dive into the details of craters yeah. and and shadow features. If you happen to be looking at the moon during a partial phase, or even now if you're looking towards a, a full moon you actually still will see uh, many of these features like the light and dark features that, that you were previously talking about. Um, so you'll have that full range to, to explore. And um, as you magnify a telescope, you need more light. But again, 
uh, the moon is just so bright. You really have the full yeah. range to work with. Uh, and that, yeah. that's, that's great because if we're, you know, if we're looking at a galaxy or something, we would need dark skies. We would also need as much light gathering as possible. We can get away yeah. with not having those ideal situations with the moon. So, uh, exactly. absolutely. I mean, starting, and, starting and, with his power seeker. Uh, and Brian, you mentioned a couple of aspects there, um, which I think are often overlooked by people. And I speak to a lot of amateur astronomers who, you know, I'm in the UK, so we get the rare clear night there and we get a clear night and I say, you know, hey, but, you know, did you get out last night observing? No, no, it was, it was too much effort to take my big 10 inch telescope outside and everything like that. A little telescope like this, you know, is ideal for the moon, but it's also, you can let it, leave it set up like this and just pick it up grab it, go out into the backyard, and you're there straight away. And, you know, the, the other benefit we're talking about, obviously, observing the moon tonight, the other great benefit of the moon is that it's easy to find. You know, one of the things that stopped me getting into amateur astronomy very early on was a fear that I wouldn't know how to find anything, even if I did buy a telescope. You know, so, but portability is, is a really important key factor, I think, in, in usability of a telescope. So yeah, that's ideal for viewing the moon, but is that the only option? Uh, I mean, are there uh, other options that are even more portable uh, th than, than a telescope like this? Uh, you could at this point, because this would be on the smaller side of a telescope, uh, you could uh, consider using a pair of binoculars, which will still benefit you greatly mm -hmm. when, when observing the moon. Yeah. So we could use, uh, we have a set of 7x50 uh, Cometron have a binoculars now. When I say 7 by 50, I'm, the 7 is actually the magnifying power, 50 being the diameter of the front objective lenses of, yeah. of the binoculars. Uh, so actually, it's the same size um, light gathering as the power seeker, but this is something literally handheld. It couldn't get any more portable, I mean, at least as far as something yeah. that you would use to, to uh, view the night sky with. So absolutely, yeah. you'll get great views of the moon. You can also use a pair of binoculars like this because it offers a... a, a fairly wide field of view. You could use a pair of binoculars like this to view an assortment of other celestial objects, uh, namely star clusters, like open star clusters, yep. some large uh, nebulae which uh, are often nice and visible from rural skies in the summertime if you're looking along the Milky Way. So there's a lot you can do. In fact, some astronomers or some backyard astronomers, you may sometimes find yourself supplementing your telescope views with a wide angle binocular view because yeah. things do tend to like i said they kind of take on different forms at different magnifying powers so this mm -hmm. set you have a real kind of panoramic view of the night sky much much more broad than it would be if you're observing through a telescope so really it looks entirely different in its own way uh, the same would be true for viewing the moon but the portability aspect you mentioned uh, this has obviously become something that's not only grab and go portable, but also transportable, whether you're going to be traveling or something, but you still want to have a set of optics that's going to let you um, do some stargazing. So this is certainly uh, but, but, a route that you yeah. can take. But, but of course, a pair of binoculars also has that great added benefit that they're superb for kind of general use as well, I always take a pair, my pair actually of Celestron binoculars down with me when we stay on the coast and I can look out at the Trinity um, Life Station and, and Lighthouse and stuff like that. So they do have this multiple use. Now, back to our new Celestron telescopes that we're installing here, uh, SLU members are gonna be able to use these every night. And uh, I think the match of Celestron's superb equipment and the world-class ast astronomical site that we've got here in the Canary Islands, I mean, they're going to be providing some unrivaled views, aren't they? What, what can our members expect through these two new telescopes, Brian? Oh, yeah. Well, you, as you say, you will have some, uh, some very high-resolution uh, images of the moon. Um, so the, the aperture is going to be working for you here. So when you have, you have, if you have 11 inches and 14 inches of aperture, you will resolve more detail, but also because your site is such, it is a world-class site, you have excellent seeing conditions. The, the atmosphere is very stable yeah. and as such, the moon will be incredibly clear and resolved even at high magnifications. Now your planetary setup, uh, when equipped with a planetary camera, it, it will be a high, a very um, high magnification view. 
uh, which is something that ordinarily you need very good seeing for, and that's precisely what you have out there in the Canaries. So uh, the the large planetary setup is going to see uh, basically uh, a high resolution fraction of the moon, and this is where you can choose to actually pick out a feature within the moon and in observe or image that at, at high. Uh, a, a very high level of detail. For example, if you wanted yeah. to to dive into the crater of like Tycho that you were talking about earlier, or to Copernicus, you, you wouldn't just see the crater. Mm. I mean, you would be able to see some of the you know the structure and the the asymmet the asymmetrical uh, you know, form of it. You'll see that it isn't a perfect circle. You will see um, mm. quite a bit of detail actually, um, and the aperture will be working for you as as it does with all things, including the moon, even though it's bright. As you increase the aperture, and these are these are about these telescopes are as big as you would really ever need to observe the moon with, and and the planets, yeah. and a number of many other things too. Now, with the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph, um, you actually would be able to pick up the full disk of the moon. But then, really, what its strong suit is going to be is, of course, deep sky objects, wide field yeah. deep sky objects. So that's very much considered a uh, deep sky. Uh, Deep sky objects yeah. being galaxies and nebulae and star clusters, this kind of thing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And 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 it's catered to a, a wide field. Therefore, I keep using the term magnification, but we could say like the image scale. It's very broad. It's very wide. And uh, mm. which can be, this can be actually kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people who are new to using a telescope or or observing with one. Uh, a lot of these deep sky objects, when I was mentioning earlier, the star clusters, some of the nebula, even some of the galaxies, yeah. they tend to be, least, many yes. of them are large, and you actually need a, a fairly big field of view to see the whole object um, side to side. Uh, now, you might think, well, if it's further away, which, you know, the deep sky objects can be, you know, obviously, literally astronomically far away, uh, you <laughs> might think you have to zoom in more or get more mag magnification, but what you really need more of is light gathering. Or you can have Absolutely. this combination of light gathering and exposure time. Uh, and it's really a matter of having a big enough field to see it. Like, for example, the Andromeda galaxy, it's massive. It's, it's about four yeah. degrees across in the sky. You wouldn't think that it's so big, but when you uh, view it through a telescope, you realize it's a very large disk of a galaxy. Yeah. So you benefit Huge from having a wide field. And that's what, that's what Rasa will do for you in addition to having the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the high-end optics that are specially suited for using the deep sky camera. Yeah. Well, uh, we must get you back actually on another show. Um, we've we've had some bad weather here, so commissioning those two telescopes is taking a little bit longer than planned. But we must get you back on, and uh, you can tell us what you think of uh, their performance live on air. But before we let you go, Brian. Uh, Celestron, you guys, you run a social campaign, don't you, to to get. Uh, people's best moon images is that right uh that's right yeah we have uh mission moon our marketing campaign where we actually would encourage anyone to, uh, with any type of of lunar image and any type and I, I i literally to the point where i've been able to uh actually even snap a picture of the moon with the iphone if you have their lighting is right yeah. or through a telescope in fact, uh, speaking of smartphones, you could, you can actually quite easily uh, hold a smartphone up to an eyepiece and get yes. uh, a good lunar image. And in fact, there are many of our users doing uh, doing this. And of course, you know, you can move to having a dedicated uh, setup with a specialized astronomy camera that's going to give you the best possible results. And with these telescopes too, I know it starts really simple with a 50 millimeter, uh, but you know, it goes all the way up to like you saw the 11 and 14 inch aperture telescopes. And there are a lot that are suited for the for the backyard that that might be more like in the five six inch range in aperture, but for this uh, we encourage anyone post it to our our Facebook uh, feed or I'm sorry you could you could set, drop us a drop us an email or uh, on Instagram you might want to check with I think it's hashtag Mission Moon where you could take your yeah. lunar image um, you know you could tag Celestron or hashtag Mission Moon and we would be happy to look at the different images that. The users around the world are submitting uh, with with their telescope or maybe even their binoculars. Uh, there are a lot of creative ways, actually. You might have a cityscape yeah. with the moon rising. There are some, oh, some you know, almost fantastic. unlimited yeah. possibilities, which we would look forward yeah. to seeing. Okay, well, I encourage all viewers to uh, send your lunar pictures off to Celestron. And uh, I suspect, Brian, you'll actually get uh, a, a few sent by SLU members once the new telescopes 
uh, up and running here. Now, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your Celestron equipment recommendations for, for moon watchers tonight. Please come back soon and tell us about some of the telescope and imaging developments uh, you guys are working on to keep Celestron at the forefront, I think, of amateur astronomy. Uh, unless, of course, you want to give us uh, any uh, teases or exclusive information. Have you got anything nice uh, that you're in development that's going to launch this year that you can tell us about? Uh, well, not, we're, we are always working on new things, which is very exciting. Uh, we did actually just introduce a, a new telescope line, which you can see at Celestron.com, which is called the Inspire. And that's that was okay. just introduced at the Northeast Astronomy Forum. Uh, just a couple, oh, of, just weeks a couple of weeks ago, yeah, and uh, that's that's something to to check out. It's actually also a fairly portable setup too. It's it's um, kind of in the same category that we were talking about before. So that's something brand new. Uh, definitely, okay. you're welcome to check it out on Celestron.com. Yeah. Uh, new features, new industrial design. Uh, there actually is a smartphone adapter on this telescope. Uh, that allow oh, okay. you to uh, right. basically very easily fasten your your smartphone to the eyepiece. Um, so it's it's a pretty exciting setup. So uh, yeah, have have a look at it's called the okay, Inspire. Okay, so we'll, well, we'll check that out at Celestron.com. Brian, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight here at SLU. Fantastic, thank you, Paul. Uh, that was uh, Brian Cogdell, uh, Astronomy Product Manager at Celestron. While we are still enjoying the superb live use. This one is from the Chile Observatory, the SLU Chile Observatory, where members get to point the telescopes at some southern hemisphere jewels. But believe it or not, and quite appropriately, the telescope that's taking this particular image at the moment is a 14-inch Celestron, and they have been the workhorses for SLU. And they just, you know, we, we invited Celestron on because, frankly, we've just been so impressed. I've been working with these telescopes for 12 years, and they operate flawlessly under the most extreme conditions, ice storms, high winds, humidity, all sorts of stuff, let alone the heat and uh, UV uh, during the summer months. Uh, but uh, look at that image as we look at this full pink moon. Looking a bit grey, not pink. If you uh, if you didn't pick that up earlier on in the show, then you can, uh, Slew members, you can watch all past shows again if you've missed it. Well, that's just about it for tonight with our mini pink moon. Uh, we've had some fascinating insights from Slew Astronomer, who is also uh, astronomy editor at the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. He's going to be with us tomorrow night, don't forget. We've also heard about some of the myth and lore uh, from Janice Stillman. Uh, she's editor uh, at our partners, the Old Farmers Almanac. Uh, I know SLU members are always fascinated by sky lore, legend and myth. You know, it really helps you to understand and remember and find things in the sky when you get into that kind of stuff. And of course, we've also heard some great recommendations from Celestron's product expert, Brian Cogdill. Uh, if you want to do your own lunar observing from your own backyard with their telescopes or binoculars, now you know what to choose. And uh, their binoculars, I have a pair of those at home and I, I would highly recommend them. Just grab and go. Doesn't matter what you want to see, just grab and go. You can see the Andromeda galaxy with those as well. It's pretty cool. Now, before we leave you, I wanted to remind you of a couple of shows we've got coming up. Tomorrow night, we are heading out for an evening of stargazing for the Lyrid meteor shower. Not helped by the full moon that we're showing you tonight. It kind of blots out all but the very brightest Lyrid meteors, but we should still see some really good ones. Coverage starts 8 p.m. Eastern on the 22nd of April. That's Friday. If you have clear skies yourself tomorrow night, use us uh, and use SLU's expert commentary and music as your meteor watching soundtrack while you spot shooting stars from your own backyard. Then I'm really excited about the next event. Uh, there are loads of other smaller events, but the next really big one, May 9th, we will be watching live as Mercury, that tiny planet, makes its way across the face of the sun for its rare transit. Coverage of that starts at 7 a.m. Eastern on the 9th of May and continues for the entire event. We're going to be with you. Uh, we have some highly specialist telescopes from around the world, including SLU's new solar telescope. 
to bring you the best views of the transit of Mercury. And of course, we've got a whole cohort of experts to keep us fascinating and enthralled while we watch those live images of Mercury. That's definitely an event you won't want to miss. Uh, that's all for now. I'm Paul Cox. This has been SLU, and we will see you tomorrow night for the live Lyrid Meteor Shower. We hope you've enjoyed our full Pink Moon coverage tonight. Good night, everybody. <laughs>